Right. Now this uh, is a, like a giving assignment, a giving topic. Uh, now that's the first time in my career I've been sort of writing an assignment with a given topic. I, I hope I you know, sort of uh, meet the expectation of the club. Um, yesterday night when I was having the dinner, the nice dinner, I, I feel a bit guilty because uh, the prime minister, the president of the club was talking about the definition of shared society and, and I realized you know, I'm going to talk about inequality or equality alone, uh, mostly uh, on this sort of income dimension. I thought that that's a bit narrow, but then since this morning, everyone been talking about income inequality. So I, I feel much better. I can uh, deliver this. Now, of course, I'm going to focus on, uh, on China. Um, and it's, it's not a, a research paper as I uh, discussed with uh, Wim uh, by email. So it's a, it's a kind of review and research paper. So we'll have con contain both uh, elements. Uh, just a background, of course, we all know China has gr been growing very fast and, and has been growing for quite long, uh, more than um, sort of, uh, 30 years uh, at almost double digit growth rate. And the, this growth, of course, um, has a lot of implications, not only for Chinese, but for virtually uh, many, many people outside, outside China as well. And, and one of the things, of course, we talk about a lot is really the implication of China's rise on a global scale and, and China become a major global power. Just over the uh, coffee break, Vim told me already there are people saying China uh, took, I was saying in my paper, China will overtake the United States, become the largest economy by 2025, but he said, that happened two years ago. So uh, China is first or the, you know, the, the, the second largest economy. Uh, but you, no doubt, it is quite big. And um, China's growth, of course, actually helped to, uh, uh, to uh, really uh, promote the rise of Asia. I mean, you can think without China's growth, where Asia rise so fast? I mean, that's a counterfactual question uh, we've got to ask. They, they, of course, this growth has uh, a lot of implication for Chinese. I, mean, I can say uh, it, it, it means a better life for almost every Chinese, but that doesn't mean every Chinese gained at the same rate. Uh, and that's a key question we're going to uh, address. And after 30 years growth, a lot of serious challenges you know, confront, confronting Chinese, the government, the population, and of course, those stakeholders outside of China. One, you know, a very serious problem is corruption. Corruption is everywhere in China, but that's not the topic I can address. Uh, to me, I, that partially really is got to uh, await for political reform, which the government, the current leadership has been talking about a lot, but has done very little so far. Whether that's going to happen for the next leadership, I don't really know. Um, but anyhow, that, that's not I'm concerned. The, the second major problem confronting the Chinese economy is really this growth pattern. Now, in some other countries, today we discussed they have you know, too little savings, like in Europe. Uh, but in China, they have too much, too much savings. They basically save more than half of their GDP. They consume less than half of their GDP. And, and the government has been doing this try to increase consumption for more than 15 years, but it's not really happening. And that's you know, a, a major problem. And this problem actually relates to this income inequality we're going to, to uh, discuss. Uh, then, of course, externally, we have the China facing a lot of problems as well. They export too much. And of course, uh, that relates to sluggish sort of domestic consumption. And that causes a lot of problems with the uh, United States and, and even uh, uh, Europe. Know, uh, the export because exporting the mean is really taking jobs away from a lot of people uh, in those countries. So, uh, and that's the external side. And, and of course, domestic, apart from corruption, they, they're probably the second most important social economic question challenge is really inequality. And that's well recognized. It's, it's not stupable, it's not sort of controversial. People realize this is getting more and more serious, it's getting worse and worse, and it's a time bomb anytime will explode. I've been talking, to, uh, talking about this issue in China in many important institutions, and people are asking, say, that, you know, we agree it's a time bomb, but can you tell us when that will explode? 
I said, I don't really know when that will explode, but if we don't manage properly, it's going to explode, and the consequences is very, very serious. So we have to really deal uh, with this income uh, inequality problem in China. But as far as inequality in China is concerned, um, there's a lot of writings, a, a fairly good sort of literature. And of course, there are a lot of interests, not only from academics, policymakers, from business community, from international organizations, which are from every angle, uh, globally, really looking to the uh, inequality issue uh, in China. It, it, it's because it, it, of course, affects China's sort of growth prospect. And that, of course, has implications for a lot of people and also for the international inequality. Uh, somebody mentioned this morning, actually, you know, China's inequality is rising, and that helps push the global inequality. Um, and, and China's globalization, of course, China is one of the most globalized economy. It's actually more open. If you use openness index by economists, more open than the, the United States, uh, than many other economists in the world. And this globalization actually uh, raised within country inequality, uh, in, uh, even in developed countries. I mean, what it's saying is because of the export, so Chinese actually taking away jobs from blue color workers in the United States, so they become poorer, and the income inequality in the United States is growing. So they're not saying that's only, you know, sort of pushing up the inequality in China, but it's pushing equality in Europe, in America, in everywhere. So China is responsible not only for those trade problems, but for, for equality as well. So uh, um, then, of course, earlier we saw this uh, dominance of uh, within country equality in, in a sort of global picture. I mean, I was asking that question. I, I mean, my understanding is that global inequality is rising, but, but actually the between country equality are narrowing down, but it's really the rise of within all these, you know, within each countries. That's the main problem, and that's where, you know, I'm sort of focusing on in this paper, I'm going to focus on this inequality inside China, not sort of across borders. Um, now, I'm not going, to, not going to tell you how important this issue is in China and, and, and globally. Uh, I, I'm sure you know you you all know that, but despite this importance uh, and growing literature, you know the significance, the interest, but but uh, you know if you go to the literature, you will find there are a lot of missing pieces on China's inequality. Of course, when you talk about inequality, you start with measurement. You want to see whether you know how large, how small, how it, you know. Uh, 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 but there are different dimensions of inequality, which is really not very clear uh, in the literature. People, you know, pick up one dimension, they, they, they make statements on that. Then the, the second part, of course, you, you want to look at the trend. If the inequality is coming down, then people get released, relieved, and the policymakers, actually in China right now, there's a small group of economists that are saying inequality in China is coming down, and don't worry about it. You know, don't do anything, not to worry because they're coming down. But, you know, I'm not sure. But, and that's where the trend comes in, not only measure the inequality at you know, statically at, at you know, in individual years, how high, how, how low, but, but how it changes over time. And we don't, if you look at the literature, or well, Chinese government doesn't really publish inequality numbers for, for you know, over time. And if you look at, look at the literature, there's no consistent systematic study on this inequality. So you, you pick up, you know, scattered information on, on you know, how large each Chinese coefficient is, and, and maybe over two or three, year period, you know, they can show some trend, but there's no really consistent time series, time profile. And then, of course, the impact of inequality. I mean, we, people can quali qualitatively talk about, uh, you know, how bad inequality is, but, but we've got to remember China was quite equal before the reform, and, and it was the equality which caused a lot of problems in the Chinese economy. That, that's where they started to break down the, the equality, try to really uh, uh, start up the economy. And, and uh, and now, of course, after 30 years of growth, it, it causes a lot of problems. But yet, very few studies try to really identify and, and, and analyze the impacts of this growing quality on different things, on growth, on consumption, on crime, on health problems, you know, all, all sorts of issues, but very little research. And that's, of course, partly because there are no sort of long time series data on inequality in China. And of course, the, the most important part is drivers of inequality. Yeah, what drives inequality? China has been fighting inequality for you know, 15, 20 years, and, and yet inequality has been growing all the time instead of coming down, I mean, until recently, a few years. 
Uh, you know, it's not the government doesn't want to do anything. They, they, they did a lot of things, they invested a lot of money, initiated a lot of policies, but it's not working. And, and to me, it's where the research problem is. People have not really identified what really the fundamental drivers of inequality and where the policy interventions should focus. Now, we know that, I mean, one example I can give you is this huge investment in the West development campaign. They put huge amount to develop the West. But later on, you will say that, that may, as far as inequality is concerned, this is the wrong policy because it's not really addressing the, 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 the major component of inequality. So we'll see that. Uh, and of course, I mean, that's just one example. And, and that requires really a care, careful uh, sort of, uh, uh, analysis of inequality in China. Now, so coming to the uh, uh, analyzing equality in China, uh, first, apart, you know, on measurement, we got to be clear on what variables we are using, whether we measure income inequality, consumption equality, or wage inequality, or inequality in assets, and so on. We must you know, be clear uh, on this issue. And also, when you talk about inequality, at what level you measure inequality? And you, if you know the literature, there are people talking about regional inequality, there are people talking about gender gap, there are people talking about sector segregation, and of course, you have individual you know, inequality between individuals or households, and that got to be clear. And the, another issue which is very important and, and for China, particularly for China, is this special price in, uh, deflator. I mean, many people just pick up the data and, and you know, calculate Gini coefficients and so on, but, but you've got to realize uh, you know, China is a huge country. Also, it, it's not really very well integrated yet, despite 30 years of market development. So price levels differ considerably, dramatically actually, across different parts of China. That means different really purchasing power. And you can't really just take the nominal income or consumption level and, and do, you know, work out the uh, inequality. Now, I can tell you, uh, I don't really have data here, but this, uh, without considering this price deflator across the location, you're going to overestimate inequality in China by about 20%. This is quite a lot. Yeah? So that's the, uh, the, 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 the third issue about measurement. Then on the uh, trend analysis, the main problem is really the data. I mean, if you have data, of course, it's pretty easy to care. But the trouble is, Chinese, they, they do have household level survey data uh, back you know, in, in the mid or even earlier, mid 70s or earlier. But the trouble is, they never release. They don't even release to the government research institutions, um, not to anybody. I mean, not to Asian Development Bank. Um, we try to go through the back doors. I don't know whether we'll succeed, but, but we're we are trying. World Bank managed to get hold of some of the data. But the data they have, we just recently discovered, they may actually have a problem as well with that data set because World Bank just recently released global poverty numbers and we did that last year and, and we have some inconsistencies but when it comes to China we believe we got it right, they got it wrong, they got it wrong, they, they got the right data but they got the wrong number. I think it's the data they got is not really representative. Yeah? So the, the data is a big issue and, and that's something I, I had a lot of trouble. Um, later on, I will come back to this uh, point. That's why I told Vim over Gmail, uh, you, might, you don't see much work, but it's a lot of amount of work I'm putting for this paper. Just updating a couple of years, it's cost me a lot of time uh, because of this data problem, and, and we managed to, to uh, overcome that. Um, then the, the, the impacts, you know, uh, the, not really much work being done, but, but again, in this paper, I'm not gonna focus on that. You know, the impacts on growth, we, we did a paper I think it was five, six years ago, and, and we could find out uh, inequality rise in China actually uh, is uh, actually hurting growth in China um, right now, but not, of course, before the reform. And, and you gotta, when you talk about the impact of growth, you really got to separate short run, medium run, and the long run. Because as I said, in the short run, the inequality may not hurt growth, and sometimes may promote growth, because you know, the, there are some uh, positive uh, aspects of rising equality. I mean, we, can't, we, we cannot say equality rise is always bad, 100%, but there are some uh, positive uh, 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 sides to that. And I haven't seen people working on the impact of inequality uh, on corruption, which in China is pretty high, and, and there are people now very much concerned about corruption and, and inequality because the economically powerful uh, align up with the politically powerful, and when that happens, it's gonna be a huge, huge problem, and, and China may not be able to tackle that. 
And that's really something, you know, personally, I'm, I'm quite concerned. And of course, the impact of inequality on, on education already is quite obvious in China. A lot of poor families cannot afford their kids to uh, high schools and universities, although primary school education now is universalized and, and you know, provided by the government. But, but as earlier, um, some of our speakers you know, said, um, really, in the end, it's not only primary school. It's really you know, the, the, the higher level of, of education, which is important for the growth and for the households to step out of poverty. And you know, uh, on some other issues, which, again, um, I'm not going to focus on in this paper. The, the main part of my paper, really, the innovative part is really try to identify some drivers. You know, what really causes inequality in China? Now, um, it's probably you know, unfair to say people did not work on the drivers on inequality in China. They did, but they basically providing a laundry list. And that's not very useful because for policymakers, I've been saying you know, to a lot of researchers, you know, policy, policymakers actually know better than academics you know, what are the possible causes. The trouble is they don't know which one is more important, which one should be tackled from what angle. And, and that's where the research is important. So hopefully, you know, this paper will give you a sort of a clearer idea as to you know, which factors contribute more and which factors contrib contribute less to the inequality. So now, so far you see that this inequality issue is so big, um, you know, covers a lot of grounds, but, but I gotta really try to define the scope of, of this paper. Uh, in this paper, basically, I'm trying to do three things. One is I'm going to try to use official and also unofficial data to try to measure the measurement part, measure regional and inner household inequality in income or consumption. So that's very clear, not assets, not wage. Yeah? Uh, and, and it's at the regional and in the household level because we don't have data on the individual level. Yeah? And we have official and unofficial data on that. The second part I'm going to do is construct a time profile, time series. Actually, try to go back to late 70s, and, and that has been absent in the, in the literature. And, and then we try to identify, quantify the drivers. That's, you know, I just mentioned, and, and we're going to come back to that, of course. Uh, and finally, try to come up with some policy implications, policy recommendations based on the, you know, sort of the analysis on the drivers of inequality in China. Uh, in order to do that, we not only need to dig out data, but our, we also need some methodology to, to come with that. As I said, we don't have household level data. I mean, we do. You know, officially, we don't. Uh, officially, they, they do have, you know, I don't know, um, they have 200, maybe 400,000 household le, uh, covered under service, annual service, but, but we don't have access to that data. Uh, fortunately, if you go back to the official statistical yearbook of China, they publish group data. What they do is they will publish the bottom 10% of population earns 3% of income, the next 10% earns 5.5%, and so on and so on. So you get probably you know, six, maybe if you like, 10 points for, for a country of you know, uh, 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 1.3 billion people. And of course, you know, people will ask, how useful is that? Well, it's not very, very useful if you, if you don't do something about it. And that's where we need uh, some sort of a methodology, and, and that's we're going to uh, where we're going to use this ungrouping methodology. So they group the data, we're going to ungroup them, and that's a methodology. That's why I, uh, I worked with Tony Sharks when I was back in Wider. And actually, we we done a lot of simulations as an analytical academic work. They, it works very, very, very well. I can give you one example. When we estimate poverty in India. Um, we do not have the, Indian does release household survey data, and you can buy it for only 1,000 US dollars, so we, we do that you know, uh, every year. But the trouble is, last year when we did the poverty update for India, we did not, they did, that time they said, oh, we, we are not ready to give you the data yet. So, but they give us group data, yeah, quantile data, so five points for a country of India. And we try to estimate poverty, and not only inequality, actually, we are more confident with uh, with inequality, you basically try to estimate the Lawrence curve and don't. But estimate poverty, that's a bit more challenging. So we used that methodology and we came up with a poverty estimate. We went to the uh, representative, the government representative from India in the bank. You know, we have board of directors. And we met with a lot of resistance. The, 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 the exact director just won't let us go. Said, you cannot really use this five, you know, five 
observations to try to come up with a poverty number for India. You can, no, you cannot. So in the end, actually, it stopped us. We never actually launched that officially. Now we are talking about that right now. Why are we talking about that now, releasing that number, which is different from the World Bank? Because earlier this year, we obtained the actual household level data. And the poverty rate we obtained from that five observations is almost identical. It differs by 0.01 percentage points, which is, which is nothing. Yeah. So, you know, we are fairly confident. I mean, I'm using that example to tell you this methodology actually uh, it, it, it works. And, and it works, I can tell you, it works better for inequality than in poverty. So we, do a, we did a better job. We did a pretty good job with poverty. So I'm very confident on group this Chinese data uh, into individual observations and, and we can calculate inequality. Um, so I'm not going to uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, dwell on that. The, the second methodology, uh, which is quite new in the literature, is inequality accounting. Of course, people, uh, economists, will be familiar with growth accounting. They try to figure out you know, where the growth is coming from. But, but inequality accounting is, is a fairly new thing, uh, probably developed in the last 10 years or so. And, and I, personally, I'm sort of part of this uh, group working on this, try to accounting for inequality. Uh, in, in, uh, once you have data, and then we'll see some of these results uh, later on. And, and that's a two-step procedure. Basically, you try to estimate in a, a function, link your variable, which you want to estimate inequality with its drivers. Then you, you come to this, break down this inequality, you know, apply inequality on both sides of your equation, and come up with a methodology to that. Now, uh, we don't really have time uh, to, uh, to give details, and I can uh, simply mention that the, our methodology is actually quite good. It deals with any functional form, doesn't matter whether it's a linear, nonlinear, how many variables, and so on. And we can allow for any quarter indicator, and you can use Gini, Tau index, X index, whatever index you want to use, and it allows interactions of your drivers in your function. And, and most importantly, our framework actually adds up, so you know, always adds up to 100%. If your Gini coefficient is 0.43, you actually end up, add up this 0.43 where you know, attributes to all those x, which is quite important. Uh, now, actually, we do have a software uh, if someone wants to use that. Um, so now comes to the measurement, come to the results. Yeah? I will go through that very quickly. And that's the you know, household inequality in China. Uh, um, I, I think we, we have data from 1977, that's right. So I managed to construct a time profile of inter-household income inequality uh, for China from 1977 to 2010. It was a painstaking process, but we managed to obtain that. On this diagram, you, you see three lines. Uh, the top is the overall inequality in China. You can see that it decreased in the early reform period, then it started to grow. Uh, uh, almost uninterruptively until uh, very recently. In the, in the last three, five years, you see this slight drop, and that's where the economists, some of the economists got excited. Say, oh, you know, look, you know, it's coming down. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not saying they, they are wrong, but I'm, I'm not really convinced. It, it doesn't necessarily represent a long run decline, long run in trend. Because if you say three, five years represent long run, uh, trend, I mean, you can see the earlier period, you know, when the reform started, inequality was declined for about three, five years as well. So that's the overall thing. The, the middle is the inequality among rural residents. I mean, you will know that China is a country. Some people say China is a country of many countries. I, I would say China is a country of two worlds. You have the rural world and you have the urban world. And, and everybody, uh, you know, who familiar with the Chinese economy would really take these two uh, separate worlds separately. Not, not to really treat that as the same. And you can see that actually rural inequality is much higher than uh, urban inequality. Urban inequality was fairly stable, as you can see the red line, uh, until about the you know, mid, middle of 90s. And now, I don't know, I haven't really done sort of work to try to dig out why that happened since the mid 90s. And one, of course, major thing uh, we know is this taxation reform in China. They, they had a huge, big reform in taxation system. And that may ha have been caught, you know, caused this rising in urban inequality uh, in China. The other thing you will notice is this convergence between rural 
and urban inequality. You know, they are converging uh, 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 sort of uh, particularly in the last few years. And also, I, I want you to, to, uh, to draw your attention to this declining inequality. It's really caused, mainly caused by the rural inequality decline. And, and we know that that's where China studied a lot of social protection programs in the rural areas. Started from probably 2006, where they abolished totally, completely abolished agriculture tax, which exists in China for over a thousand years. The first time in Chinese history over a thousand years, they totally abolished agriculture tax completely. Then they start to introduce health insurance, age pension, and you know, educational assistance, and so on from then. And that uh, might be, I don't know, you know, could be contributing to this decline in rural equality, of course, which is part of the overall inequality. But the thing is, if that is the case, that's a sort of one-time shock. It doesn't rep represent a long-run impact. I mean, that's where my suspicion comes from. Then, um, the, the second diagram I want to show you is this urban-rural income ratio. As I said, China is not just one country. It's one country of two worlds. It's the urban world and the rural world. And, and on this diagram, you can see it's, it's a urban over income per capita income ratio for all the provinces and over the years. Now each, um, the box, they call it box plot. Yeah, each block box represents one year. So we have from about 79 to 2010, yeah, each year. And, and you can see, yeah, the, 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 of course, the y-axis is a ratio. I mean, you can see some of the ratio is five to one. In other words, in that particular province, urban income is five times the rural average income, which is quite dramatic. And of course, that's only within each province. We haven't really do this the ratio between the richest province uh, and, and the, you know, the, the poorest province. And that sometimes it's, you know, peop, they, are, they have numbers about you know, nine times or 10 times average income, not individual. And that's sort of a very, very sort of large disparity gaps between the rural and urban income. And, and you can actually see that. If you focus on, on this box in the middle, that's, that's where the distribution is. You can see that there's a fluctuation, but generally it's an increasing trend uh, in the urban uh, rural income ratio. And that actually has, later on I will come to that, uh, that that's actually the, the major component of inequality in China, overall inequality in China. Uh, so that was really sort of, uh, the overall in income inequality and the urban rural issue. Then we come to regional inequality. As I mentioned, I also wanted to estimate regional inequality in China because that's where the Chinese government started this Western campaign, West development campaign. That's how they're based. And, and, and of course, it, I mean, you are right, regional inequality also uh, has been increasing uh, for many years. Uh, there, there are some fluctuations, but overall, it's been increasing. And also, similarly to the household inequality, rural inequality between regions is also higher than urban inequality between regions. So you, you see that urban inequality is always lower. You know why? Well, because the, the planned you know, system before the reform, because during the planned period, everybody gets the same pay virtually. Very little income difference. And of course, it's already 30 years, but that impact uh, has been still felt in China. Okay. Now, so we, we saw the trend, we saw the sorts of uh, 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 different aspects of inequality. Let, let's try to, try to dig out what really are the major drivers of inequality. The first thing I did is uh, look at regional inequality. Now, we saw earlier that the top, the top of this diagram is actually the total regional inequality we just, I just showed you. And we can, through analytical methodology, we can break down that into two parts. Uh, one is the urban rural gap I just shown. Uh, we said it's quite large. This rural urban gap, how much that contributes to total regional inequality. And that's the sort of green component of this diagram. Then all the other factors, drivers, yeah, contribute to this red part. So what do, we, what do we see here? Well, we can see that first, a large chunk, about 70% of total regional equality are caused by this urban-rural gap. Only about 20-30% to 
due to whatever the other factors. So that's, that's the first important finding. The second finding, you will see that from this diagram, very simple diagram, you see that the changes in the total inequality, you know, the fluctuation at the top, is all driven by this urban rural gap. Because the bottom part, the red part, is fairly stable, particularly in recent years. You know, if you look at since 1995, after 1995, you know, where they, this, they started this uh, major taxation reform, all the increases and changes in regional equality are accounted for by urban rural gap, nothing else. You see the, the red part is almost horizontal uh, from 95. So this diagram actually highlights the dominance of urban rural gap in China's regional inequality. Now you might ask, this is regional inequality. What about household inequality or individual inequality? Yeah. What, how much this urban rural gap contributes to the you know, inner household inequality? That's the decomposition you know, uh, we obtain. And again, the top part is the contribution due to urban rural gap to inner household inequality in China. And again, you see that particularly recently, it accounts for about 50% of the overall inner household inequality in China. So if you say, you know, people, there are you know, debates as to what sort of Gini coefficient in China is. You know, some say you know, 0.48, you know, high 40%. Some say it might reach 0.5. Um, but even say, you know, 0.5, and if you can eliminate this urban rural gap, what will be the Gini coefficient? 0.25, which is actually pretty low. It's probably too low. Yeah. So again, even in terms of this uh, in individual inequality, this urban rural gap is very, very important. It's fundamental. Then what we did is, of course, I mean, that, that, I, in the paper, you can read some other details, but we also did some uh, in quality accounting. I want to simply show this uh, table. And, and, and this is based on unofficial data. The earlier research findings, all based on official data, we did the ungrouping. Then we did all these breakdowns, decompositions. Here is the uh, results based on unofficial data because we don't really have individual data. Uh, uh, from the government source. So we used some survey data conducted by individual researchers, came up with this uh, inequality accounting. And you can see that you know, this is, I also got to mention, uh, this inequality is based in consumption expenditure. So we know that expenditure inequality is lower than income inequality because there's consumption smoothing, uh, there are sort of uh, in, in within household transfer and so on. So consumption inequality, but even by consumption inequality, the bottom is Gini coefficient. You can see that it's uh, 44%. And that's quite high. I mean, that means income inequality probably reached about 50% uh, in China. And, and you know, we have sort of two years data, and, and we did two years uh, decomposition. What you can see here is uh, now, because it's two, uh, only rounded to two decimal points, so you don't see the changes you know, in inequality, Seems you know same actually increased from ninety five to two thousand seven. Um, it doesn't show up there, but if you look at the last two columns, that's where the the accounting results is. Yeah, you can see among hundred percent. Yeah, um, the 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 province dummy contributes about fifteen percent. Actually, that that's the same for both years. You know, in the mid nineties and and late two thousand. You know, so the the location. Um, is uh, uh, quite important. But, uh, but above that, yeah, the urban dummy, which is representing the urban rural gap, yeah, contributes, the earlier period in the 90s contribu contributes about 13%, but now contributing over one quarter to overall in quarter in China. Now, you, gotta, you might say, this is not consistent with your earlier results, but you gotta remember the earlier results, we only took urban rural, uh, Division. We do not consider other factors. Here, we consider all the major drivers of income and income inequality. We have education, we have age, and then we have employment sectors where they employed. Uh, we have you know, labor input, we have household size, and we have age composition, and so on. We, we basically took almost you know, all the uh, major sort of determinants of income and income inequality into consideration. And even you know, considering that, 25% you know, of the inequality is due to uh, this urban-rural division uh, in China. Then, of course, we have uh, 
uh, sector segregation, uh, and we I done a paper, and that's a that's related, of course, to the letter to the to the policy recommendation because uh, you, you will know China going from planned economy to market economy. They they actually sold a lot of state-owned enterprises. Now the economy may, consists of probably 60, 70 percent of private sector and, and 30 percent of probably state sector. But the trouble is in the current leadership, the current leadership actually push forward the state sectors. And they try to actually at the expense of private sector. It, it's a lot of complaints in China. And it's causing a lot of problems as well because this monopoly in China, the telecommunication, the energy sector, the road sector, these people are earning huge amount of income, salaries, yeah, wages, and, and the benefits. But they, you still have you know, over 100, 120 million people are living under $1.25 a day. Yeah. And people do blame this monopoly in China, the, the, the dominant of state sector in China. Right now, the Chinese government is facing with this huge problem. You might heard in the news, you know, recently the World Bank launched this report in China. The president was there, the deputy prime minister of China was there. Then they had this guy stepped on the stage, said, you know, get out of China, <laughs> World Bank, and, and then try to privatize the Chinese economy, and, and you, you really try to sell China and so on. And it's caused a, a big outcry. Cry. But then, you know, people ask me, you know, what to do with this problem? Because the monopoly is, we know that as economics, it's actually cost us efficiency and also cost us uh, equality as well. But what are we going, to, we're going to do if we're not going to privatize, if we're not going to allow international competition? I, I don't know. But what I'm saying here is really the sector segregation, the monopoly, you know, is also quite important in contributing to overall inequality in China. And that, of course, would have uh, uh, implications for policy as, as far as policy implications are concerned. And of course, there are some other uh, inequality contributions. I was wondering whether you wanted to go on to your policy. Oh, you want to come to policy? I was wondering whether this particular section, it's quite a short section. I wondered if you went on to policy and then took time for discussion. Right, sure. Let, let, so I'm going to skip yeah. this. Yeah. There are some other, of course, um, uh, 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 to drivers, which uh, we don't have to uh, uh, discuss in detail. So it comes to, to policy recommendations. The, the first is, of course, we've got to tackle the urban-rural gap. Because, I mean, we've shown that. It's not only a, a, you know, a guess, but, but it's analytically, we, we saw that um, uh, it, it, it's the dominant, the most important factor causing inequality at any level along different dimensions in China. So I actually propose fast urbanization. Now, I'm saying fast urbanization because last year the Chinese government started this next, the new five-year plan. And before the new year, five-year plan, ADB was consulted, of course, IMF, World Bank, and, and they brought these top economists from Harvard, you know, from uh, Stanford to China, tried to talk about urbanization. And, and I, was hope, I, mean, I was hopeful, actually I was involved, I was hopeful the Chinese government were set up a, a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a higher target of urbanization because I believe urbanization is very important um, for at least as far as uh, inequality is concerned. I mean, not mentioning efficiency. I mean, we know that urbanization is good for efficiency, but for even for inequality. But unfortunately, and, and very disappointedly, Chinese government set a pretty low urbanization rate. By 2030, 60 percent. Yeah. And of course, some of you will know the uh, McKinney actually released a report. They proposed about 66%. I'm actually proposing 80% of urbanizing rate by 2030. Because as far as the equality is concerned, there are only two options for you to try to solve this urban-rural gap, which is the largest component. One is taxation and a fiscal transfer, right? So you take from those who have jobs, who have some income, and then you give to the, to the poor rural people. But given this huge gap, given the large proportion of rural people, at the moment, officially, 60% of population are rural. But, but this 40%, among the 40 urban residents, they are not real urban residents. Those people with urban hukou, or their household registration, only is about 30%. So you really talk about 30%, I mean, they are not very rich, the 30%. They, they, they were off, they're better off. 30% not so rich people try to help the 70% of poor rural people. How long can you do that? You cannot do it, right? So shifting resources from urban to rural is not going to work no matter what you do. And that's shown already in the last 
20 years or so, Chinese government has been trying to do that and they try to you know, initiate this campaign of socialist countryside. I mean, initiated by my friend Justin Lin, you know, the, the senior vice president of the World Bank. But I mean, you know, this is wrong. You can't expect the rural sector to continue to grow or grow faster than the non-rural non sector. It's, it's just economics, no, I mean, even no economics will know that. How could you expect that? To, no matter how much government support you give to the rural areas. Right? So shifting resource supporting agriculture is not going to work. Then there's no other option. The other way is a lot of rural people come to the urban area to share the growth benefits. And that requires true urbanization. Allow them to settle in the urban areas, give them training, help them with housing, education, health, and so on. So that's where I propose this 80% and it caused a big trouble in, in China. I mean, wherever I go, you know, people say, you are ridiculous, 80%, because by definition, US urbanization rate is 81% today. And, and you talk about China, 20, 30. Now, China will grow, but not that rich, and, and you talk about 80%. But I said, if you want to solve the inequality problem, yeah. and even doing 80% is not going to really eliminate the inequality problem. It will help to moderate the inequality problem in China. So that's the first, and it's a controversial, I, I have to admit, admit a good, fairly controversial. But, but I, I also can tell you, I'm actually gaining support from various parts. I mean, when I give this talk, in Peking University, the, the top university in China, you know, before the talk, the, including the vice president was saying, you know, Guanghua, I like you, but I don't like your proposal. After the talk, he was silent. And then over lunch, after our, another 15 minutes check, he said, you gotta come back to Peking University, go to the largest school of seminar. You gotta tell people why that is the case. 80% is important. And then I, you know, had supports from even you know, U.S. academics you know, at various seminars, you know, we're not sure, but after your talk, yeah, it, it seems to make sense. Yeah. So the, the second, um, uh, po so that's a first policy recommendation, right? and, and it's not a simple one. Actually, you must, you know, see quite simple, you know, just urbanization, but it, it's not that simple. The second one is, uh, of course, pro migrant social protection and training. It's very important. Now, at the moment, they do train rural people in China. They, they, they have this leading group on poverty, a, a ministry level a guy doing training. But the trouble is they only can do training in rural areas at the origin, which is a bit difficult, which is not efficient, which may not be very really effective. So what I'm saying is really, you gotta train these people, you're gonna spend money on these people, you, you should give them social protection. But instead of helping them in the origin, help them after they come to the cities. That's my proposal. So, helping solve the China's rural peasant farming problem in the urban areas, that's my saying. And sometimes, you know, foreigners got confused. How could you help? Because in China, they have three rural problems. Yeah, rural economy, rural people, and, you know, the farming sector, and they call it Sanlong, three agriculture, three rural. And they, they're being focused, the government, always focused on the rural areas to solve this problem. I'm saying you've got to solve this problem, but not there, in the urban areas. And that's where this sort of pro-migrant social protection and, and training. Uh, you can see more details in the paper. And um, I'm I, earlier I mentioned, I, I want to propose downsize this social limbs new countryside funding. Because at the moment, they, I think they, they propose 30 trillion uh, funding, 30 trillion Chinese currency, still a lot of money over 10, 15 years to fund this program. I'm proposing to downsize that. To downsize that, not so sort of taking away from the rural people, but putting into the urban area to help the migrants. Yeah. Rather than sort of building more roads, building high rise buildings in the rural area, which I said, look, after 15 years, it's already happening actually in China. Even schools are becoming idle. Nobody uses that school anymore. The, the, some roads are become useless. You, know, you spend a lot of money on the 10, 15 years. Why do you do that? It's a waste of resources. So, now, so that's as far as urban-rural gap, three major uh, policy recommendations. What about regional inequality? Well, regional equality, uh, the first policy recommendation is fiscal transfer. Now, I don't know earlier we had uh, people say, you know, fiscal transfer in some other countries uh, also sort of uh, regressive. But in China, it's been regressive for many, many years. Uh, and we've got to make that progressive rather than uh, regressive. Um, I know China is making progress on that front already, but we should emphasize that. Um, 
on the taxation front, um, you will know uh, China started growth by supporting the coastal areas. That's where they start, you know, through the taxation policy, they give tax concessions to FDI, to uh, enterprises. Uh, that has more or less phased out, no longer exists in China anymore. But what I'm saying is they should, you know, reinstitute this policy, but in the inland areas. Help the inland areas. Now, we know this industrial transfer is happening already in China, but it's very slow, and it's not working very well. You know, they transfer. Many industries are actually moving away from China, from the coastal areas, instead of moving to the inland areas. That's what the Chinese governments expect or hope. But what's happening, they move to Southeast Asia. And that's, what I, that's where I think China should really design policies, try to keep those industries, keep those FDIs in China. And of course, it's becoming so expensive in the coastal areas. The, the enterprises cannot afford anymore, so that's why they're moving away. But they can move to inland, where it's still much cheaper yeah. than coastal areas. And uh, quite important is this capital development. Uh, in China, uh, we mentioned earlier, you know, this sort of uh, money is being so cheap. I think it's so cheap, but probably nowhere so cheap in China. It's uh, very, very cheap in China. Uh, but the, the main point I'm making is this cheap money is not for everybody. It's not even for medium-sized enterprises. It's mostly or, or, or most exclusively for the state-owned enterprises. Yeah. I mean, I was surprised I have friends running, you know, sort of million dollars or even, you know, a billion dollars of private enterprises. They don't they cannot borrow from the banks. And they have a lot of money there. I mean, we know that China has a lot of money, but they don't really help the small and the medium-sized enterprise. And you know, people are proposing that, but I don't know when that will materialize. So capital market development in China is very, very crucial. Uh, another thing is this incent incentivize local government. Nobody raised that question for solving inequality. What's happening is in China, uh, the, the politicians are being promoted based on their performance. And that's a good thing. And that's, a lot of people are saying that's why China has been growing so fast. And it's been growing almost everywhere. Even in poor areas, you also grow because these politicians from the top to the bottom try to push up growth. Then they can, can get a promotion. And a promotion means everything. Right. Uh, so they have that system throughout. I mean, even though it's a big, huge country and, and a diverse country, but, but everybody is pushing growth. And, and that's why China has been growing. And it has been growing for you know, over 30 years. The trouble is they, they ignore equity issues. They focus exclusively on growth, on efficiency. And that's where I'm proposing, you know, in your sort of performance radar, you've got to really let inequality indicators come in uh, to the play. So I'm actually in the paper, I propose an indicator combining growth and inequality when they're going to assess the politician's performance. And we know that once you do that, the politician will follow. You, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, they, they are still politically appointed, but, but these guys are good. You know that. They, they can get things done in China. I mean, that's a major thing, actually, if you compare China with, with India. I mean, they can, down. They, can not bad, they can do bad things. They can do good things, but they can get things done if they want to. I mean, that, that's the main thing. And if you do this, you, you put this inequality in their assess, assessment, they will get things done. And we know that at one stage, you know what? China wanted to bring environmental issues into GDP you know, discount. And of course, that was stopped in the middle. But we know that once they bring that you know, local assessment, in, uh, the environmental issue will be tackled uh, quite well. But it didn't happen. So I'm hoping, I don't know whether that's going to happen. That's only my own wish whether the Chinese government will do but But it is a serious issue. I, I hope the government one day will take this into consideration. Um, <clears throat> they, there are, of course, a number of, I mean, earlier, this is based on the earlier research finding, but there are some policy reforms um, uh, uh, we, we got to, uh, uh, I'm proposing. One is centralized social protection. Now, as I mentioned, we do have social protection study you know, in the last three, five years, and, and it is actually good for uh, sort of improving equality. But, but the trouble is most of the social protection are localized. The, the big problem, deficiency of this problem is, is you know, people, I mean, it, it impedes mobility in China. And of course, uh, in mobility, actually, of course, is bad for equality, for equity concern. 
And that's where we try to propose, you've got to centralize the social protection system uh, to allow this fiscal transfer to become progressive and portable. Portability is the main argument, main point here. Uh, the second part is, you know, uh, is this urban-rural gap. Um, now, the urban world enjoys a lot of protection and high-level protection. The, urban, the rural people only started to have protection, which is good from none to little. But I think China should try to really uh, make these two converge. That's very important for them to reform this household registration system. I mean, people, you know, I, I, I'm sure the Chinese government can just overnight through one piece of paper said, gone, the household registration system. But the trouble is you have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, policy sort of cost theory. How do you implement that? You know, you have 60% of rural people, you 30% moving to the urban areas over a couple of years. How do you really do this social protection? Because urban households enjoy, you know, 10 times of social protection of rural people. And that's going to cause huge problems. So what I'm saying is they should try to gradually make this to converge, narrow down that difference. I mean, what I'm saying is maybe they, they can sort of, you know, sort of not increase the urban social protection amount, still keep them there, not sort of tied up with CPI, not tied up with uh, growth, but let the rural people sort of grow the social protection. So until a certain stage, this household registration system becomes useless. It, it, it doesn't matter anymore. You don't even have to reform it. Because a lot of people are pushing for reforming this household registration system, which to me, it doesn't mean anything. They can't just say, no, it doesn't exist anymore. But, but it's not going to be helpful as long as the social welfare, welfare sort of protection differs between these two groups. And you need time uh, and you need steps to, to do that. And the, the another point is introduce this PPP, uh, which is called uh, private-public uh, partnerships. Uh, I mean, in other words, I'm, I'm really suggesting you know, entry of private capital into some of the you know, monopoly enterprises in China and allow for foreign competition to break up the uh, state monopoly, um, which is political sensitive, but I would think China ha you know, must do that I mean, one way or, or another. Another issue, uh, uh, recommendation is this uh, land quota trading and the social housing. I mean, for the urbanization, 80%, it's, it's a huge task. It's, it's, it never happened in human history. Uh, but basically, there are two things you got to do for the migrants. One is job. Uh, you got to let them have certain jobs, whether formal, informal, highly paid or low paid, they got to have jobs. Now, uh, I don't know whether in my paper, but elsewhere in my research, I actually did calculations. Jobs, job-wise, they are okay. A lot of actual research found migrants we have about 250 million migrants at the moment in cities. 250 million, they are not urban residents. They don't enjoy anything, but, but they, they're not illegal. Almost are illegal migrants in the urban areas. But over 90, 94% of them always have jobs. It's even better than the urban residents. So uh, jobs-wise, they are okay. Now we want to improve their working conditions and so on and so on, but that's a different matter, I guess. The other thing is really housing. Uh, I mean, that's the concern. I'm very much concerned because you can buy housing, but the trouble is housing prices in China skyrocket. I mean, you, some of you may hear report. The Chinese government put this, uh, 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 a sort of uh, the current prime minister is, is still betting on, on his name, actually, in history for this issue. He apologized. Uh, never happened. Uh, apologized just as uh, was a week or two weeks ago to the whole world, said, you know, he. He's sorry he did not do his job well because the housing price is so high in urban areas. Well, I mean, the urban areas, the, the one implication from our perspective is really, even you allow the, the migrants to go to the cities, you know, you give the social benefits as well, same, but they cannot afford the housing. It's so, so expensive. I mean, even me, if I go to Shanghai or Beijing, I cannot afford to buy a house in Beijing, and, and, and how do they settle? So, and that's where this proposal is. What, what are we doing is there's a good thing in China is every migrant have land. You know that, right? And in the 50s, they, have this, they had this land reform. So everyone has a piece of land back in the countryside. Now, of course, the land in the urban fringe becomes so expensive. A lot of millionaires being produced. I mean, you see some farm reports in the newspaper, you know, the farmers has no education, drive BMWs to, to farming. 
uh, drive a couple of kilometers, you know, living in a sort of high-rise building and, and drive there to do farming. And not really much farming work, but that's the problem. That's the situation because they had land near the urban areas so expensive, so they sold that land and, and they pocketed, you know, a large chunk of it. But a lot of Remote areas, the land doesn't really worth, it's not worth anything. And that's where these people are needing help for migration and urbanization. Uh, on the other hand, in China, every city has certain quota for sort of urban buildings yeah, from the government. You can only have you know, 500 hectares this year for urban expansion. You know? And then actually this quota from the, you know, from the central government to provincial government to county government, to the local government. You know, it, it goes like that. What we are proposing is, um, so far, for many years, when they you know, buy the land, the land belongs to the state ownership, uh, belongs to the state. Uh, the government, of course, will give part to the farmers, to whoever you know, owned that, not really owned, I mean, usership, uh, that land. The large part goes to the government for urban construction for infrastructure, that's why you see sort of high-rise buildings, you know, beautiful roads. Uh, this underground building in China is getting crazy. You know, you have the trams and, and, and you know, uh, but that's all funded from, from this. Uh, but the, the, the problem with that, that's not sustainable. And also, it's not really helping the right people. Those actually people migrated from the remote areas. So what we're proposing is actually, they can give up their land back in their home country, right? That land is not really worth much. But what they could do is they can come to a city, then the central government can allocate this quota to this city where they're going to accept this migrant. So suppose they give one hectare in, uh, you know, I don't know, where bought Russia it's with nothing. It's, it's desert, right? They give one hectare. They come to Shanghai, the richest city. Shanghai government, of course, want more land uh, because they make a lot of money out of it. It's worth a lot of money, the land in Shanghai. But the government won't give them that much. It's fixed. So what they do is, if they're going to accept one migrant from the area bordering Russia, and that family has, say, you know, one hectare land, the central government, that land will go back to the, to the central government because it's state owned. They can give Shanghai one hectare of quota extra. And that one hectare worth meanings. And that millions of dollars, part of that can go to the migrant, part of that can fund social housing, and part of that can go for urban infrastructure. So, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, actually I can stop here. <laughs>